This podcast is brought to you by the Islamic Center and NYU. For more information, visit our website at www.icnyu.org. Inshallah, today we're continuing with part four in our discussions on how to cultivate a sense of spirituality within these hearts and souls of ours. And over the last several weeks, we began by, first of all, defining the soul, speaking to a couple of important factors which perfect and cultivate these souls, specifically three which we mentioned. Firstly, was the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thirdly, via deeds and actions, we gave a couple of examples. And thirdly, about a vigilance that we need to have and a certain care meaning that we should always feel that there's more work to be done. Last week, uh, as well, we spoke uh, with regards to a couple of questions uh, around accounting and uh, intention, meaning what does it mean to hold ourselves to account? And similarly, what does it mean toward perfecting our intentions? And virtually, we asked a question for a large portion of our discussion with regards to whether or not um, we will be held to account for our intentions. And in summary, without getting into that discussion in detail, we talked about the fact that if someone sets a good intention and for whatever reason is not blessed or given the opportunity, is not given the tofiq to actually act upon that good intention, that out of God's grace and out of his mercy and his compassion, he still rewards us for coming up with that good intention. On the flip side, if for whatever reason we set a bad intention to do something, and we gave a couple of examples, but it did not materialize, meaning we set an intention that, I don't know, we were not going to pray, but then we ended up praying that because of God's grace and his mercy and his compassion, he won't hold us to punishment for that. But nonetheless, we spoke about the difference as well between Isab and Iqab whereby God holds us to account, which is different than being punished. And just the idea of being held to account in the eyes of God should be enough for us to hold ourselves to account prior to. I don't want to be told what I've done wrong, right? Even at work, at school, you rather not get called into your professor's office or into your manager's office. If uh, you could avoid doing so, most likely we all would avoid doing so, even if we're not in trouble because we don't want to be held to account. Similarly, when it comes to our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even though he may not punish us, at the end of the day, our relationship with God should not only be through this lens of God's wrath upon us, but more so it should be on the basis of this relationship that I have of closeness and proximity to God, where I don't want him to ask me, hey, why did you do that? Why did you even think about doing that? That in itself pretty worrisome. And for today's discussion, inshallah, I want to continue kind of our conversation around uh, sincerity, around intentions, uh, and really in regards to holding ourselves to account, and continue kind of where we left off uh, last Thursday. Again, we spent quite a bit of time with regards to the theological question of whether or not, again, our intentions will lead or what our intentions lead us to. Let me try to be a little bit more coherent for those of you who are not here. Again, we, say, we stated that our deeds and our actions are of two types. The first type of deeds and actions that we engage in are the deeds of our limbs, our eyes, our hands, our tongue, the words that I speak, the things that I eat, that which I hear, Right? Or, all the, or all the actions of our organs. On the flip side, we may act in a certain way with heart. We talked about the example of Amr bin Ma'aruf and Nahi al Munkar, commanding others toward good and forbidding them from evil, which is also a religious obligation of ours, whereby we stated that if we see oppression taking place on the streets, and at the very least, if we don't feel bad about what is happening, right, then we can be held to account, and we are actually committing an act of God's transgression, a sin. And the idea is to restrict ourselves, obviously committing sin via our organs, 
the eyes or the our physical limbs, and at the same time allow for our hearts to reach a state via our effort, our focus, our prayers, our ritual, our diligence, to the extent whereby we actually feel a sense of sympathy with everything that might be happening on the streets, right? In terms of injustices, in terms of sin, in terms of vice, even if we feel like we can't make a physical difference, right? We give example that if someone from amongst our friends, from amongst our community was drinking alcohol, right, for instance, and if you know that if you were to tell him or her, like, so you need to stop drinking, they're going to, like, push back and they're not going to want to talk to you anymore. That's not the right way then to approach them. But if we reach out to them in a softer, kinder way, and we feel like they may be receptive to it, then we should go for it. But at the very least, we should feel the pain in our life. That's the least level of the hair. Anyhow, again, all of this is a summary for with regards to some of the things that we spoke about last week. For today, inshallah, I want to start the conversation by talking about the effects of bad intentions and how that places or leaves an imprint on our hearts. Intention, like we know in our tradition, is amongst the most important staples of any deed. As the prophetic tradition of the Prophet states, that all of our actions, the basis and the foundation of them are our, are our intentions. And that moving through the moments or through the movements of prayer, standing and bowing and prostrating during the course of our sarat, void of any intention in itself is not prayers. I give the example of my child. My child, my younger daughter, she's four years old. She doesn't know what prayers is. She knows what prayers is. She knows when her mom prays. She knows when her father prays. And she might make the movements of prayer, but no one would state that that is prayer because she doesn't know the intention or what it is that she's doing. You just know that she's doing an exercise of standing and bowing and prostrating, and it makes her parents happy, and they think it's cute. Right? But more than that, because there's no intention, the prayer in itself is not a prayer. Which is why scholars of Islamic law have stated that every act of worship, every act of worship requires an intention. Prayers requires an intention. Fasting during the month of Ramadan requires an intention. Even performing the wudu needs an intention. Going for hajj, you need to have an intention. Any act of worship that we perform requires an intention. And the idea is that this intention, that intentionality, that mindfulness that we have prior toward engaging in the, in the ritual, that is what allows for the maximum reward on the basis of our intention. Does that make sense? Am I being clear? Similarly, the more good intentions that filter through these minds, through these hearts, through these souls of ours, the greater the opportunity to draw closeness and proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is kind of what this is all about. And that's what we spoke about day one. Let me just say this. When we talk about closeness and proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we're not talking about a closeness or a proximity, of course, that is physical, right? We're talking about a spiritual, meaning that when we define the soul on day one of these lessons, some four weeks back or so, we stated that the soul is a metaphysical entity, meaning it's not something that is tangible. You can't feel it. You can't touch it. You can't taste it, right? It's something that is metaphysical. And similarly, the relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also, of course, not physical. We're not physically drawing closer to where God, someone says heaven is up there, that every day we're sort of taking another step in this ladder toward touching and feeling and being in the physical proximity. But no, we don't believe that. Again, we mean it symbolically, we mean it metaphorically. So going back to kind of the point, when we set bad intentions, negative intentions, it has the opportunity again to leave this imprint on our hearts and our souls. Let me give you a hadith that helps support this. It is stated that one day, Prophet Isa alayhi salam, he tells a group of his companions, he says, my brother Musa, my brother Moses, told you, meaning told the community, generations before, to never commit an act of indecency or fahisha, to never commit a sin. 
And he says that I will take the advice of my brother Moses further, and I will tell you not even to think about committing sin. What does Musa salam, tell his community? Make sure you stay away from sin. What is Isa alayhi salam saying? He said, I'm not telling you not to commit sin. I'm telling you to not even think about committing sin. Because when you open the door to even think and ponder about it, it's really hard to close that door. You follow what I'm saying? Because again, once that sort of intention is filtered through your heart, there's an opportunity to really mess it up. Right? I'll give you an example. We actually have a, like a tradition that tells us that bad intentions are like rooms in your home that have a lost decoration. It's a nice place. You have a nice home, but no one wants to walk into the room if it's empty. So the idea is that once your heart is void of good intention and it's filled with negative intention, right? And just think about it like tangibly. When you set yourself up to doing something Indecent, when you set yourself up to committing an act of sin, even if you hold yourself back, internally, you don't feel good about it. You, know? you wonder, why is it that I've set myself up for this in anything that we do in life? You know? Which is why it's so important. Because psychologically, physiologically as well, when you set yourself up to being more optimistic, to doing something meaningful, to being more positive, the outcome of it is that much more real and successful. I'll give you an example. There was an article some years ago. I think it was in um, like Newsweek or Time magazine. Many, many years ago when I was in college or when I was, when I was uh, in graduate school. Whereby it spoke about the fact that there were some neurologists who created some mechanism to measure happiness. Measure happiness in the brain. And they concluded that those who were determined to being most happy were those who saw happiness on the face of others. Not a follow up, but I'm saying for just a moment. When people see other people happy, it makes us more happy. Think about it during the course of your life. It's nice to receive a gift, right? Who wouldn't like to receive a gift? We all like to receive nice things. Have you ever given a gift and seen the happiness on someone's face? Have you ever given a gift to a child? How happy do they become? Even if it's the smallest, silliest thing. People who give out of themselves, who give out of their wealth, many times they do it because it offers them some sense of contentment and solace. Who's the most beloved person in the world? Take a guess. Everybody loves this particular person. Or most people do. I think. But the most loved person in all of the world, in history, is Jesus, a.s. Muslims love him, Christians love him, people of other faiths love him, right? There's not someone as universally and like widely accepted and like loved and adored and respected, someone that people wouldn't blaspheme, right? It's Jesus, a.s. Why? Like, what, what, what were his accomplishments? What was so unique about him? It is reported even in our hadith that Prophet Isa salam, he would wash the feet of his disciples. He would wash their feet. And they would go to him and they would tell him like, like, oh, Prophet of God, we should be washing your feet. Why are you washing ours? You're the Prophet of God. And he says, this is to humble myself, to remind myself that I'm your servant, Islam saw himself, and to remind yourselves as well to be humble in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to know that your Prophet is doing this for you. What's so unique about Prophet Isa salam, is that he knew how to give out of himself. He knew how to share a part of himself and be humble in the process. I say all of this because going back to that study, that when you see happiness in the face of others, you go back and you think about kind of like the way that we intend the way that we set ourselves up for success in this world. Oftentimes, there are going to be processes and systems in place in school and at work and in different groups that you're in and whatever it might be that bombard us with images of what success should look like or what you should intend to do. 
Why do you want to become a doctor? Why do you want to become a lawyer? Why do you want to become a banker, right? At the end of the day, everything is driven on the basis of what your finances are going to be, how wealthy you're going to be, right? Even if you take a look at the way that we determine success of a nation state in the world today, it's like via GDP, right? Like how much money is this country making, right? How much poverty is in this country? Everything is supported via the metric of wealth. And like we know within Islamic tradition, money is not your ultimate goal or ultimate barometer of success. It's rather who you are over here, right? In this heart, in the soul. And that happiness itself, according to the neurologist, is not the one who is the most wealthy. But like we know, according to this particular study, the one who gives out of themselves and sees happiness on the face of others. Someone who's altruistic. Someone who's willing to give, willing to support others. So going back to kind of what it is that we're speaking to, particularly when we work or when we're striving toward um, cultivating these hearts or these souls of ours, it's so important for us to recognize the sort of negative effects of bad intentions. And not only bad intentions, but setting ourselves up in gatherings with negative people or with people who are sinners or with pe we're all sinners, but people who sort of draw us into the path of vice. You know, again, we talk about this idea of perfecting and purifying the soul of ours. Our environments, they have a direct correlation to either our spiritual growth and success or toward our spiritual detriment. It's true. Whether we like it or not, we are like a product of our communities, that we are a product of our societies. And it's really, really important for believers who take this you know, part of theirs seriously to make sure that they're surrounding themselves, that we are surrounding ourselves in gatherings, that we are surrounding ourselves with people, that we are surrounding ourselves in a community that allows for us to, on occasion, at the very least, remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because if we're not, if we're not cultivating that within ourselves, then what's going to happen? In the same way that you set this negative intention, even if you don't act upon it, it leaves this imprint on your heart and your soul. You make the intention before you go to sleep, like tomorrow I'm not going to wake up for future prayers. Even if you do wake up for whatever reason, the fact that you intended to, meaning that you, means that you've given yourself a way out. You've given yourself a way out down the road. We don't want to do that. Again, similarly, our gatherings, right? our circles, the social sort of communities that we sit in, they all leave an incredibly important imprint on these, on these hearts and hearts. So where are we taking that value from? Where are we taking kind of this path to success from? With others who remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we're more inclined then to also remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Make sense so far? So again, in summary, though when we set this negative intention or when we have this bad intention, when we say I'm going to do such and such, but don't act upon it, even though it might not be something that leads us toward getting punished or whatever, we don't always want to see and base our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through reward and through punishment. In the famous sort of statement of Mamadi ibn Abdul Talib, he states, Ilahi la abattuka khawfan min narak wala tama'an fi jannatik walakin abattuka li annika ahlun li dalik. He states that, oh Allah, I do not worship you. I do not worship you due to the fear that that I have in your fire, in your punishment, nor do I worship you for the hope in attaining your reward. Think about the way that we see things. And I get it. it makes sense. We like tangible things. We understand through tangible things. I spoke about this for those of you who are here on, on last Friday. Some of the characteristics of paradise, because that's the way that we understand things. But again, our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should be beyond physical, right? Why do you go to work so I can get a paycheck? No. You don't only want to go to work so you get a paycheck. That might be a means, but it's not the end. Again, paradise might be the means, but not the end. What is the end? 
I worship you because you're worthy of worship. Why would I not want to worship this God who's so kind, who's so loving, who's so compassionate, who's so generous, who's so beautiful, and who gave me all of the opportunities that he did? You follow? So again, the way that we see things is always through physical forms, is always through tangible means. And that's fine as long as there are means to the ultimate end. If those Quranic verses that talk about punishment, they prohibit us from acting in a certain way, and they incentivize us from holding ourselves back, then good. Similarly, if reading about the Quranic verses that talk to us about the tangible materialistic you know, uh, rewards that we attain in paradise, again, they incentivize or they motivate us to, 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 to acting in a certain way, to behaving in a certain way, to doing extra good deeds and whatnot. That's good. That's great. But the idea is to go beyond that. Because if we're only seeing on the basis of tangible things, then at the end of the day, our relationship becomes limited. I'll give you this example. That if I tell my daughter comes to my daughters come to me and they tell me, Baba, well, I want you to buy this for me. Where at I don't know, any store and they see a toy that they like, everywhere I go, they always choose something that they like, right? Anyone have kids in their family? Younger siblings, nieces, nephews, they always want to choose something when they walk into a store. This pack of gum, this pencil, this pen, this lollipop, this teddy bear, something always comes up. And sometimes when I tell when they ask me and they're crying and they really want it, I tell them I'm not gonna give it to you. They say, if you don't buy this for me, I don't love you. Right? Why? Because in their intellect, the way that they perceive is if I get this, my father loves me and I'm going to love him back. But if he does not give this to me, then there's no more love in this relationship. How is our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala similar? Somebody makes dua, they say, oh Allah, if you give me this, I want to be so happy. But then what happens? You don't get it? And then what? Stop believing in God. How many people? How many people? They see, see, see God that way. Only through this relationship of things. Right? I want to get married to this person. I want to get this job. I want to have a child. I want this to happen. I want this. And they're all valid requests. And you should ask. Don't limit your da ever. Ask for everything good in this world and everything good in the next. It's good. No worries. Allah, give me the good in this world and give me the good in the next. It's fine. But when you don't get it, our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala becomes like the relationship between a child and his parent. And that's, that's not what we want. So what do I tell my child? I tell my child, I tell my daughter this, my daughter this all the time. Whenever they tell me that, <laughs> unfortunately, it's more often than I'd like, Baba, we don't love you if you don't buy me this. I say, it's okay, I still love you. And then what? And they say, okay, we love you too. Why? Because they realize that, wait a minute, our relationship's beyond this lollipop. And even though, even though we know in his book, Allah Azza wa Jal, he tells us how much he cares about us, and he tells us how much he loves us, and he introduces himself via his mercy and his compassion and his love for us, we end the conversation with him by saying, you don't give me this, you don't care about me. That's a problem. That's problematic. And it starts with the way that we started the relationship with God. You know what I'm saying? It starts with the way that we perceive Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be in the first place, which is why people come to that conclusion from, from, from the get-go. So when we talk about this heart and the soul, as we've been talking about for the last of weeks, it's so important for us to understand who it is that we're working toward Meaning, through this process of attaining closeness and proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, once you know who you're worshipping, once you know why you're seeking, then things become that much easier. I'll give you this example. A lot of times, going back to that same statement from Mamadi and Nabi a lot of times people in their relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they perceive again through these physical and tangible means, paradise, punishment, so on. The way that we get beyond 
the way that we get beyond these physical forms of paradise and of and of and of reward and of punishment and of fire, and to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with a little bit more clarity, is to remember that it's us who have the opportunity or who have been given the opportunity to fulfill some sense of potential in this world. Let me try to break this down a little bit further in case I'm not, I'm not being clear. On that day when God created the human creation, when he created Adam, السلام, and he prostrates, and he, sorry, he tells all of the angels to prostrate toward him. Anyone know how this episode took place? Many of you may have heard it before. It's in chapter 2 of the Quran. Whereby Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states that we have created, that have created this Adam, this creation of mine, in each other, for the Arabic of Haditha, and I want you to prostrate toward him. Before they are all commanded to do so, angels, they ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that, you know, why are you creating this creation? When we are in a state of glorification and praise of you all the time. Angels, they're pretty incredible creations. Our tradition tells us that angels, when they're commanded to stand, they stand. When they're commanded to bow, they bow. When they're commanded to prostrate, but they listen to everything of God's instructions. Very different than the human being. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds to them by telling them, In the a'lamu mala ta'lamu. I know something about this creation that you don't know. I know something about Adam and the human species that you don't know. You know there's potential in this human being to reach a height that's higher than that of the angels. And in that famous prophetic hadith, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam states that God has created the angels with the power of intellect. Intellect in this regard means that they have the ability to be receptive to any and all of God's commandments. Like we said, God tells them to stand, they stand, tell them to bow, they bow, tell them to prostrate, they prostrate. And he has created the animals that roam this earth with desire. Desire for food, the desire for sex, the desire for sleep, the desire, you know, to, 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 to dominate, to pass, you know, for power, so on and so forth. And we created the human being with both of these, both the desire of intellect and the desire, and, and Sorry, both the power of intellect and the power of desire. And if the human being allows for his or her desire to overcome his or her intellect, they become worse than the animals. They still have potential within it, but on the flip side. Because we are tested in a different way. We are created differently than the angels if we allow for, as the prophetic Hadith states, if you allow for the if you if you allow for your intellect, your ability to know. To, to perceive Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to dominate our desire and suppress it and channel it solely in the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala desires, the way that He cares, the way that He has commanded, then we have the opportunity to ascend to a height higher than that. And that's what we're seeking for that potential. And when you know that you have that opportunity within you, then why would you want to waste that soul, right? Why would you want to waste that? Why would you want to waste this heart? This world, like we know, is, as, we, as we mentioned last week, is like pretty fragile, more than we've ever experienced before. Ajib to Yemen, I shared with you the hadith last week. Ajib to Yemen, Nasi al Mot, Wahua, Yar al Mota. I'm amazed at the one who forgets about death and he sees death around him all the time. So we don't want to waste the opportunity. We want to know our potential. We want to know and strive and create those necessary steps so that we don't see the world solely through these tangible physical means. You don't want to see your work, your life. I don't want to see the same way collectively as individuals. Our careers solely through the object of how much money we're going to make at the expense of the soul of so again, in summary, and inshallah we'll continue uh, next week. To keep in mind the effects of our intentions, both positive and negative. When we set positive intentions, the tawfiq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this divine help and support and providence, it has the opportunity to be facilitated and reach us in ways that we could never imagine before. 
when you set good intentions, when you work for that, for these lofty goals and intentions, inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will facilitate. But on the flip side, if we set bad intentions, if we surround ourselves by those who are void of remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we'll also leave this imprint on these hearts and souls. So again, going back to that theme, inshallah, we'll talk more about this next week. We'll focus the entire talk on, on that is again, how to remain vigilant, how to be vigilant and careful of the soul. Like we know, or like we're going to be talking about, inshallah, the soul in the same way that it's drawn toward the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's also a component of it that commands or, 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 or leads us toward deviance. And that conflict, that conflict between its desire and aspiration to attain beauty at the expense of that part or that component of the soul that desires this physical, tangible, materialistic world. That's like th this, this term jihad that we always talk about. Inshallah, next week we'll discuss that a little bit further. If you would like to listen to more, please donate to www.icnyu.org slash donate. For more of our virtual programs, go to www.icnyu.org slash classes. If you have any questions, email us at info at icnyu.org.